We are preaching a sermon series on renewing the mind. And this is week number six. I don't know how long I'm going to go on this. I thought I was winding it up, but there's so much to it, and we just can't miss it. And while we're, while we're on this train, we might as well ride it all the way to the end. Glory to God. Because renewing the mind is something that the believer is going to do for the rest of their Christian walk until there's a shout and a trump, and then we're going to really get our mind renewed. We're going to know as we are known. We're going to, we're going to see as we have been seen. Glory to God. So this is week six of a sermon series entitled Renewing the Mind. And today's message is entitled Training Your Brain for Success. Training your brain for success. Renewing the mind. Let's go to our text verse in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me just go over the, our text verse one more time. Do not be conformed to the world. Do not be. Do not be conformed to the world. The world wants to conform you, mold you, shape you into its secularized image. Don't do it. Say no. Everybody say no. Turn to your neighbor and say don't do it. But this is what we should do. Paul says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not a suggestion. It's not an encouragement. It is a command of scripture by the apostle Paul. Be transformed. Be transformed. It's not that you should be. It's you, you are to be transformed. Do this. Be transformed. And we're told how to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the, the transformed mind is simply a mind that has been trained to come into agreement with the thought process and the decision-making process to bring it into agreement with the Word of God and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit spirit. So if you train your mind, your thought process, if you train your decision making process to come into alignment with, to come into agreement with the word of God and under the leading, the anointing, the guiding of the Holy Spirit, you are now in the process of renewing your mind. When you think in the Old Testament they had similar uh, encouragement or similar um, admonition it says in Joshua 1 and 8, Joshua said, This book of the law shall not depart from my mouth, but I'll meditate it on both day and night that I may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you will make my way prosperous. Then I will have good success. In other words, your prosperity and your success depends on the word of God being in your heart, your mouth, and in your mind. Hallelujah. <laughs> if you can renew your mind to the word of God, it will transform your life. Then you will have prosperity. Then you will have good success. So we are called on to renew our mind. Where's your ameners go? Thank you very much. In week one, we talked about transformed or conformed. I say let's not be conformed to the world, but let's be transformed. Week two, we talked about having control over our thought life. Week three, we talked about the spiritual laws that affect your thinking. Week four, we talked about reaching God's potential in our life and dealing with the strongholds that want to hinder us from getting to our potential. Week five, we talked about the renewed mind reveals who we are. Do you remember our text verse for that? Who, the real you, do you know who the real you is? In Ephesians 2 and 10, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. Yeah. Hallelujah. The real you is a masterpiece. I said the real you, you were designed, you were made, you were painted, you were sculpted by the master himself. That makes you a masterpiece. And that means you have value and that means you have purpose. Yeah. You have value. You, let me tell you the value that you have. You are valued at the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
God paid the highest price that could be paid for your soul, the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no greater price to be paid, and he paid it willingly, lovingly, joyously for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. Everybody say, thank you, Lord. You have value, and you also have purpose. Remember our text, that you may prove. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. Good and acceptable, perfect will of God, purpose of God for your life. There is a good, there is an acceptable, there is a perfect will of God for your life. It is your God assignment. It is your God-given purpose. But we don't get there unless we renew our minds to the Word of God. Revelation of the Holy Spirit. Say, I'm going to do it. Say, I'm going to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today, I want to talk about training your brain or renewing your mind. Training your brain for success. There is no more important pursuit in life for the born-again believer than renewing the mind because that's where the transforming of the life comes from. So when you get that revelation and everybody in this house says, I got it. After six weeks, we got it. Praise God. (laughs) This is one of the most important pursuits that we have as a believer is to renew our mind for the transforming of our life. So it is so important, in fact, that I'm going to say to myself, I've got to train my brain. I've got to bring my brain into alignment with the Word of God. I mean, this is no kidding around anymore. i got to get serious about this. The the Christian walk is not a passive thing. Listen, this morning, Debbie drove us to church this morning. She usually drives on Sunday morning uh, because I'm studying my notes. And and so I'm sitting in the passenger seat. And you know what? When you're sitting in the passenger seat, you get to enjoy the ride, but you have no control over the direction, the speed, the 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 anything she's in the driver's seat I was in the passenger seat I got to enjoy the scenery but I had no control over the actual function of the vehicle come on somebody I was driving home late, late after service one night, and, and uh, we were, actually were going to the hospital between after service, and um, I, I was going along at a pretty good clip down the road, and uh, feeling, feeling good about life, you know, and uh, before I know it, there was a raccoon right in front of the car, right in front of the car. Why did they do that? Right in front of the car. I mean, can't, can't they reach up and push that little button that says crosswalk, you know, wait, and, but no, right in front of the car, and, and Debbie's looking down I see it right so I'm like ah! I'm off the road I'm in the grass now I'm like ah and then Debbie's like ah and then the raccoon is like ah praise God hallelujah praise God I missed him hallelujah we all live to see another day glory to God That raccoon was all fur fangs and eyeballs. I'm telling you what. Ah! Hallelujah. But he lived. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But my point is this, that the the Christian experience is not meant to be lived in the passenger seat. It's meant to be lived in the driver's seat. Glory to God. You're, you're supposed to take the wheel, glory to God, under the direction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Get in that driver's seat and start going for it, man. I tell you what, pedal to the metal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did I tell you one time I was in a drag race? Yes, I was. I, we were raising money for missions, and, and I'd never been in a race car before. And, and it was on a dirt track, short oval track. And they said, Pastor Watts, if you do it, we'll raise a lot of money for missions. This is at a different church now. And I, I said, no, I've never done that before. He said, you really need to do it. It's for God. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> Don't tell me it's for Jesus. Don't guilt me into it now. I said, no. I said, really, here's the problem is, is th- those cars, you know, are stick shift and 
all that, and I've been in an uh, automatic car for too many years. I couldn't do it. They said, we'll find you an automatic. I said, an automatic race car? Who has an automatic? They said, we'll get you one, Pastor. I said, okay. I finished dead last. Dead last. I was so slow. The guy who was my, my mechanic, right? He gave me his car. He was the mechanic. I said, how fast did I go? He said, you were so slow. I could have gone out, rotated the tires in the middle of the race. You were so slow. You would have never have known the difference. He said, I've never seen a car go that slow before. I was, I was like this, man. I'm the slowest thing on the road. I was like this car swing going by me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy actually had to walk out on the track and tell me the race was over. I, I've been lapped so many times. I didn't even know when the race was over. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He finally just walked out and waved me down. Pull over, man. It's over. It's been over for hours. Pull over. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But hey, here's the thing. In, in, your, in your faith life, in your Christian life, get out of the passenger seat. Get into the driver's seat and, and, and determine that you're going to train your brain. Turn to your neighbor and say, train your brain. In other words, renew your mind. Train your brain. Be, because now here's the truth of it. Here's the truth of it. The, getting saved is easy for the sincere heart. Paul said, you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's easy to get born again for the sincere heart. Hallelujah. Uh, the thief on the cross got born again in the last moment, last breath of his life. It, it's easy to get born again. But becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's a whole different ball game. And listen, people have got to get from this thing of, of being born again and then sitting on the pew for the next 93 years waiting for the shout and the trump. We got to get in the game. We got to get become a disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus didn't mince words about it. He says, listen, if you're going to become a disciple of mine, you got to pick up your cross and follow me. He, he, said, he said, you've got to count the cost of discipleship. He said, who builds a tower but doesn't sit down first and count the cost of what it's going to cost? Because you don't want to get halfway through it and realize you don't have the money to finish it. He said, who raises an army and, but doesn't count the cost before he raises his army to make sure that his army can match the army that's attacking him? He said, if you're going to walk this walk of faith, you have got to count the cost because discipleship has a demand on it. Becoming born again is an easy thing. But listen, if you want to transform your life, and you want to be successful, and you want to be that tree planted by rivers of living water that the, the, the leaf does not wither, and you bear forth fruit in due season, and everything you put your hand to prospers, then you've got to count the cost. Because now we're talking about discipleship. And discipleship is, is, is a whole new ball game. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. We are called to be disciples of Christ, and we're in an environment in which we can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We can do it. I said we can do it. We can transform our minds. We can renew our hearts. We can grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Why? It just takes a paradigm shift in our approach to faith. Our approach to faith cannot be passive. Our approach to faith cannot be merely a spectator sport. Our approach to faith has to be in the driver's seat making it happen. In other words, you look at yourself differently. You say, I am a student of Christ. I have a textbook, the Word of God. <laughs> I go to a classroom, the local assembly. Come on, church, somebody. I do my homework. I walk by faith. I pass the tests of life by the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. It just simply takes a paradigm shift from saying, okay, I'm a believer to I'm an active disciple. And as an active disciple, I'm a student. I have a textbook. I listen to my teachers. I attend a classroom. I do my homework. And I pass the tests. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, train your brain. Train your brain. Hallelujah. 
I train my brain for success because I have the revelation that I am a student. Everybody say, I am a student. I am a student. Say, I am a disciple. Look with me in Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go, therefore, and make disciples. That's us. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you unto the end of the age. Make disciples, teaching them. Make disciples, teaching them. Becoming a disciple of Christ and, and living according, observing the teachings of Christ is not always easy, but it is profitable. Yes, it's not always easy, but it is profitable. Your success is tied to becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, not everybody's had good school experiences. Not everybody has enjoyed their school experiences growing up through kindergarten, up through 12th grade, and, and maybe uh, college or vocational school or whatever. It be. Not everybody has had good church experiences, uh, I mean school experiences, but the Holy Spirit wants you to have a good church experience <laughs> because in your school experiences growing up through all the stages of, of maturation and whatnot, uh, not all of that uh, is fun, you understand, but this is different because this has the anointing of the Holy Spirit involved in it. This is a supernatural experience. Uh, that was a natural experience, but this is a supernatural experience, glory to God, and it's so necessary. Uh, I have a master's degree, I have a, a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and, uh, and from that I, I developed a certain skill set in uh, studying, I, I developed a reservoir of information, I developed a uh, problem solving ability and critical thinking ability, and, and that's what school does for you. And so as a student, I had a fellow tell me one time, he says, I don't know if I should go to school. I said, well, yeah, of course, go to school. Or Go to, go to vocational school or something like that, but, but uh, take something on that will challenge you. He says, I don't know what I want to be yet. I said, well, the first two years of, of college anyways is, is figuring that out, what, what you, what you want to do. But in the meantime, you're developing a skill set. You're developing critical thinking. You're developing problem-solving skills. You're developing uh, the zone, as it was, how to get into a studying zone, how to, to shape your mind so that you can can ingest a bunch of information at the same time. It's all valuable. It all comes into play. That's why as a student, I would encourage you when you come to church, bring your notepad. Take down notes. Glory to God. I, I, I was a great note taker when I was sitting in the, in the pew. And if I go to listen to someone else preach or seminar or anything like that, I'm, I'm taking copious notes. Or I write in the margin of your Bible. How many of y'all write in the margin of your Bible? Glory to God. That's the thing about electronic Bibles. You can't write in the margins anymore. I, I like to highlight things. I would have my pen and my highlighter, and I'd write down the, in the edge of, of the Bible. I had someone tell me one time, you shouldn't write in your Bible. You shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't write in your Bible. That's a holy book. You shouldn't write in your Bible. I said, okay, get one Bible that you don't write in and another Bible that you do write in. Because I'll tell you what, in reading my Bible, there's so many nuggets that I have in there over the years. Glory to God. Uh, sitting under pastors preaching for so many years. When I went off to Bible school, he had set me up for success because all of the doctrine that he taught me, I was a good student under him. I listen to him. All of the doctrine that he taught me. All of the principles of God's word that he taught me. When I got to Bible school, I wasn't hearing stuff for the first time. I had already heard it. Glory to God. I knew what they were talking about. Hallelujah. No, nothing caught me by surprise. Hallelujah. I knew where to find it in the Bible. Glory to God. Because I had sat under good teaching and I had paid attention while pastor was talking. And listen, in today's church, we, I think we've lost that, that desire sometimes to just bring a pen in a paper or write in the margins. I'm not hearing any amens right now. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I think some of that's because we've shifted over to electronic Bibles uh, largely and there's not room to write. I, I, was, I heard a criticism. I was in a different church and I heard a criticism came to the leadership of the church. Someone said, I'm sitting by someone. All they do is text all, all service long. That's what they're doing is texting all service long. Well, it turned out that they were electronically taking notes 
on their, on their phone. They weren't texting. They were taking notes on, on their phone. And so things have changed, but however you do it, make sure that as a student, you're not missing nuggets of wisdom or nuggets of revelation, but that you're getting them down. Hallelujah. <laughs> Study to show yourselves approved unto God. I, I want to read the amplified version of that, 2 Timothy 2 and 15. It says, study and be eager and do your utmost. Study, be eager, do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial. A workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of God. Listen to these first few, few words. Study. Be eager. Do your utmost. Study, be eager. How many of y'all are eager to hear the Word of God? How many of y'all study the Word of God? How many of y'all are doing your utmost to get the Word of God off the page and into your heart? Hallelujah. Study, be eager. Do your utmost. And then Psalms 119 verse 12 says, Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I've declared all the judgments of your mouth. I've rejoiced in the way of your testimony as much as in all riches. Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I'll meditate. I'll delight. I will not forget. I'll meditate. I'll delight. I will not forget. Listen. The Word of God is the bread of life to the student, to the disciple of Christ. Lord, make me a student, a disciple who is hungry for and eager to hear the Word of God. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, yes. I'm a believer, yes. I'm a disciple. Disciple means a disciplined learner and follower of Jesus Christ. I have a disciplined approach. And, and you know what? Maybe the disciplined approach is as simple as this. When I hear it, I make note of it, not just mental note of it, but I make note of it somewhere in my, in my writings. I have boxes full of tablets of scriptures, of sermons that I have heard over the years. I, I had a, a lady one time in, in service. She would write down uh, my sermon notes in her Bible and then date it. And then if I, if I preached the same thing twice... Or refer to the same thing. She'd come up after service. Pastor, I remember when you preached that six months ago on such and such a day. I said, thank you so much for that refresher. <clears throat> um, but, 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 you, but you write it down. Hallelujah. And uh, that's part of being a, a good student of the Lord. And let me tell you, you're a lifelong student. It doesn't quit. You're a lifelong student. You, you should, in today's world of uh, multimedia, access to preaching, teaching, seminars, Word of God, there's so many ways to get the Word of God. Uh, usually when I'm uh, typing up a sermon, I'll split the screen. I have a big monitor in my office at home. I'll split the screen and I'll have a, a, a little uh, box opened up to somebody preaching the Word of God. It doesn't have to be related to what I'm preaching on, just as edifying. And it's not something that I'm always listening to directly, but, but it's just word. It's, it's word. It's word filling up the room. And, and it it's an, inspires me, and it's anointing. And so I, I'll listen to, to Creflo, or I'll listen to Miles Monroe, or I'll listen to Bishop Tony. I'll listen to somebody. And I'm just being There's so many ways to become a student of Jesus Christ. That we're without excuse. Let's just say it. We are without excuse. Hallelujah. I train my brain because I'm a student of the Word. I'm a lifelong student. Uh, Brother Maxwell says growth has to be intentional, and that's being a student of Jesus Christ. You just have to intentionally do it. Glory to God. I train my brain because I'm a student of Jesus Christ. I train my brain for success because I have a textbook. That Word of God that you're holding in your hand right now. It is the book of books, hallelujah, the inspired Word of God. A textbook means a book that's used as a standard work for the study of a particular subject. Well, we got it. We got the book of books. 
In fact, it's a whole library. It's 66 books altogether, 39 old, 27 new, 66 books. You're holding a library in your hand. Hallelujah. The word of life. Hallelujah. And you got it in your hand. 2 Peter 1 and verse 20 says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy, and your, that Bible is a book of prophecy, in Scripture ever came from the prophets themselves or because they wanted to prophesy. It was the Holy Spirit who moved the prophets to speak from God. 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. Everybody say profitable. profitable. Say profitable. profitable. For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good word. That's not just the preacher. That's you. Yeah. Thoroughly equipped. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, my point is this. You have the most unusual book that's ever been written because that's the book that's been inspired by the Holy Spirit. My dad taught college uh, engineering for 45 years and every once in a while he'd be hired on the side to edit a, a book on engineering. And so I'd see him in his den at home and uh, dad what are you doing? He says well I'm, I'm, I'm editing this new book that's coming out. New textbook that, that's coming out. I said, I said well that's, that's awesome that you're doing that. He says, you know, there's one book that never needs to be edited. There's one book that never needs to be updated. There's one book that never needs to be changed. That is the Word of God. That book came out right the first time. Hallelujah. You can trust it. You can build your life on it. But we do need to read it. Hallelujah. We do need to ingest it. Glory to God. We got every kind of Bible that you can imagine, every kind of version, every kind of, to make it simple for us. Glory to God. I, I, was t I was witnessing to a fellow who was installing cable. This was back when we were in Bible college. And I was sitting outside on the lawn of the apartment reading my scripture. And he came up to me and he says, I'm, I'm going to install cable in your apartment. I, I said, great. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading, my, reading the Bible. He says, really? He says, why? I said, because I'm a Bible student. I, that's what Bible students do. We, we read our Bible. I said, hey, there's church tonight. You should come with me to church. He says, I never, I never really go to church. I said, you should come with me. Oh, it's great. You should come with me. He says, well, I got a Bible. I said, well, you should bring your Bible. Let's go to church tonight. I said, I will meet you in the lobby of the church tonight. I'll meet you there. I'll be waiting for you. Don't disappoint me. I will be waiting for you. You show up with your Bible tonight. We'll have a good time in church. And he did. He showed up with his Bible. But his Bible was one of those big, giant coffee table <laughs> Bibles. It was as big as the coffee table himself. It should have had wheels and a handle. It was tucked up <laughs> under his arm. You know, he came in with that, that big old Bible. You know those family Bibles, you know, that it's not just the giant print, it's the double giant, triple giant print. I said, man, you came prepared. He said, yeah, I brought the Bible. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, however, whatever version your Bible is in, that's your textbook for life. Hallelujah. That's the standard that we live by. Hallelujah. That's the one that is inspired by God. You say, you say, I don't know if I can trust it. That's what people always say. I don't know if I can trust that. That, that book was written by, man, it was inspired by God. It, the man may have held the pen, but the Holy Spirit inspired. And there's, never, there's never been a book. There's never been a book that's been under such scrutiny as the Word of God. And it, it holds up to every single test. Holds up to the, the, the bibliographical test, internal test external test. It holds up to every standard test that can be applied to it. And it has never changed. It'll never be changed. It always proves out to be the true word of God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. I train my brain for success because I have teachers who will teach me the word of God. Hallelujah. And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Jesus gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You need a pastor. You, you need a pastor teacher in your life. Amen. Yes, you do. I said, yes, you do. Amen. You need someone that's going to teach you the Word of God. You need someone that's going to do it boldly. You need someone who's going to build your faith and edify you. Come on now. 
You need, because it says that the pastor teacher is going to, verse 12 of Ephesians 4, they're going to equip you for the work of the ministry. They're going to edify you in the body of Christ. They're going to build you up. They're going to fill you up with faith. They're going to get you ready to stand against the storms and the tides uh, of opposition in your life so that you can come through victoriously for Jesus Christ. You need a pastor. You need a bold pastor. You need a pastor who's willing to stand on your toes every once in a while to get the truth of God's Word into your life. You need a pastor that, that fears God more than he fears you. Somebody better be saying amen. Glory to God. You need a pastor that comes ready to preach the Word. If he's the only preacher, one in the room by himself, he's still going to preach that Word. You need a pastor that's excited about the Word of God. He's prayed up the Word of God. He's studied the Word of God. He loves the Word of God. He's preaching from the overflow. Glory to God. You need a pastor. You need a pastor that can get you from born again to entering into the kingdom of heaven. Glory to God. You need a pastor that will shepherd you, that will feed you, that will lead you to green pastures, still waters, through the valley of the shadow of death. You need someone that loves your soul and someone that's willing to stand in the fear and trembling of God on judgment day and take responsibility for teaching you. Hallelujah. You do not need someone that's going to tickle your ears. You do not need someone that will be your buddy. You do not need a golf partner, a canasta partner, an uno partner. What you need is a man of God, a woman of God that cares about your soul and wants to get you in, wants to get you into victorious living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, you need a pastor. You need a teacher. And, and what you can't do is show up. Bless me, pastor, if you can. Let, let's see if you can bless me today, pastor. Let's, let's, come on, pastor. Try, do your best. See if you can bless me. No, we need to. Listen, when I walked into a college classroom and I sat in that classroom, I, I, when I raised my hand to ask a question, I, did, I, I said, Professor, I don't understand this point. Could you take a moment to explain this to me? He would say, show me your notes. <laughs> I was showing my notes. He, and he, he'd see that I would take notes to, to try my best to get it. He said, all right, man, you're trying. All right, here, here's the answer to this. Listen, we got to quit showing up and seeing if, if everything's just right for us. We got to quit showing up to see if, if, the, if the, the, the music is just right, if it's the songs I like. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, somebody. I know this isn't comfortable right now, but if you smile and shout about it, it'll be okay. Hallelujah. We, we got to get past the, the thing of, well, are they going to do the music I like? Or is the temperature going to be just right for me? Or is the sermon going to be too long today? Or is there going to be so much Bible? I don't like it when he does 20 verses. Why can't he just do two verses. I mean, why does it have to be so much? It feels like I'm in a classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are in a classroom. Let me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We are in a classroom. It's called the classroom of all. It's called the classroom of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The church should be your spiritual classroom. Hallelujah. 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 I've seen, I've seen slides from our missionaries where they're preaching the word of God, sweat to the bone, dirt on the floor, hardly a sheet of metal on the roof. Everybody's exposed to the heavens. And the room is full. And everybody's walked for hours to be there because they want to hear the word of God. What's happened to the church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America that if we don't have the climate set just right or if the decibels aren't just right or if the preaching is too long or if there's too much reading or if the person that is someone else is sitting in the seat that I want to sit in or someone cut me off in the parking lot or, the, or it's not at the hour of the day that I want what's going on what's going on what's going on what's going on 
going on in the church of Jesus? Hallelujah. What's going on in the church of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. 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 I've had people tell me, I listen, I pour my heart out every Sunday, every Wednesday, and days in between to my mature believer friends. And then I've received criticism because all he does is talk about the next generation. Man, I'm preaching to y'all every single week. And yeah, I'm going to talk about the next generation because when y'all start to go to, when y'all start going to heaven, somebody's got to fill these pews. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. I received criticism because I was told, you came to this area, I prayed you into this area, you're supposed to be ministering into this area, and now you're going to other countries to preach the word of God? No, you're called here, you're not called there. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Go ye into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Hallelujah. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Of all the criticism I have received in ministry, never once, ever once, has anybody said, Pastor, you have not preached the word of faith. Have they never said, I disagree with your doctrine? They have never said, I disagree with your worship. Not once, not one single time. But it's too cold or it's too hot. Or it's too long or it's too short. Or it's not comfortable for me. Come on now. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I said, y'all know what I'm talking about. What we have here is a school of learning. And if you will show up to the school of learning, I promise you, I will come prepared. Or my wife will come prepared. Or the associate pastors will come prepared. And we will teach you the word of God. Hallelujah. 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 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word with an exclamation point. Have we done that this morning? Man, I thought this was going to be some sweet little quiet message. Hallelujah. Y'all are pulling on the anointing. This is your fault. This is your fault. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and and, and teaching. Verse 3. For time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. Be turned aside to fables. Preach the word. You need, you, need a, you need a preacher. You need a teacher. Yes, yes you do. We all do. We I said we all do. Yes. We all, I, need, I do too. Yes. We all do. Yes. We preach to equip. We preach to edify. We preach to promote the truth. We preach to promote faith and hope and love. And we preach the entire word of God. Paul says, Acts 20 and 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So I've done it all. I've preached the whole thing. i preached the whole thing, the whole counsel of God. Great desire, uh, I mean the great problem, challenge is, is when the church of Jesus Christ says, you know what? We just... We just need to cut this word down a little bit to fill up the pews a little bit more. We need to, we need to limit the Holy Ghost a little bit in order to fill the pews up a little bit more. Well, you end up with a full house. You end up with a river that's a mile wide, but it's an inch deep, and nobody's got the anointing or the wherewithal or the education or the understanding or the principles of faith to stand with, to stand against the winds or the tides that are formed against them. No, what we need is more Holy Ghost. What we need is more Word of God. What we need is... 
Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Do you know the Holy Ghost is your teacher? That's what makes it so good. Is that when you're reading that word, the one who wrote the word is reading it back to you. Hallelujah. Then it jumps off the page and gets into your heart. That's called the gift of faith. It comes alive to you. Gift of faith. Help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sent in my name. He will teach you all things. He'll bring to your remembrance all things that I've said unto you. John 14 and 26. Put that in your notes. I will train my brain for success because I attend a classroom. Your church. It's a complete paradigm shift. If you say that it's my tradition to go to church. That's, that's a wonderful tradition to have. It says that Jesus went to church because it was his tradition. That's a wonderful tradition to have. If you go to church, adding on top of that, if you go to church because you look at it as a classroom and you're earning your degree in victorious living, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Oh, oh, oh praise God. This is, this is my school of learning. I heard Creflo say, church is a school of learning. It is. It should be. Must be. A school of learning. Hebrews 10 and 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works within each other. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves. The early church had this down pat. It says of the early church that they were in the temple daily, that they were in church daily, that they searched the scripture daily. There, there's something about that 24-hour period of grace and, uh, and the church experience. And it shouldn't matter who's in the pulpit. The, 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 the idea that, well, is pastor going to be there? I'll show up if pastor is there. But if pastor's not going to be there, then I'll wait till pastor's back. But it's the word. It's not the pastor. It's the word. <laughs> Heard uh, Bishop Tony tell a story that he was in South Africa and he was ministering at a, at a church and, and it was a uh, midweek service and there were 7,000 in attendance, midweek service. And I think it was actually an off night. It was like a Tuesday or a Thursday or something night. And uh, the, the senior pastor came in and said, uh, Bishop, uh, we have about 7,000 in, in attendance today. And Bishop was like, wow. He said, praise the Lord. Oh, oh my goodness. That, that's fantastic. And, and he, says, he says, Bishop, I want you to understand. Uh, we're, we're thrilled that, that you're here, but they're not here because you're here. They would show up no matter who was here. Uh, if, uh, if an assistant pastor, associate pastor, if an elder, if a Sunday school teacher, if a parking guy in the parking lot was in the pulpit, you'd still have 7,000 people show up because they came for the word. Uh, they came for the word. Hallelujah. They came for the word. Glory to God. I train my brain for success and I do my homework. I train my brain for success because I'm a student. I train my brain for success because I have a textbook. I train my brain for success because I have teachers. I train my brain for success because I attend a classroom. I train my brain for success and I do my homework. In other words, I, ex I exercise my faith. The word that I hear, I do it. Jesus says, those who hear my word and do my word, I liken him to a, house, uh, a man who built his house upon a rock. I, I train my brain for success by doing my homework. Uh, classwork is one thing. Hearing the word taught is one thing. And taking notes is one thing. But then you always take your classroom and uh, classwork and supplement it with homework. And it's the homework where you're applying, did I really get it? 
Do I, did I really understand what was being said? Do I know how to work the equation? Do I know how to solve the problem? And, and you listen, and you think you got it. You think you got You think you got this faith walk. You think you got this love walk. You think you got this grace walk until you're doing it at home by yourself. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's in the homework that you get the revelation that your faith works like everybody else's faith. You, you don't need the preacher to come over and exercise his faith when you've got the same word and the same Holy Ghost and the same operation of faith in your life as he or she does in their life. You can pray the prayer of faith and God shall save the sick. Come on. You, you can do anything that anybody else can do. God's no respecter of persons. Homework is where you gain your proficiency. Here you get the classwork. Here you get the edification. Here you get the encouragement. Here you get, you get the, the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Out there you put it to practice. Amen. And that's where you get the proficiency. It's like, man, I, I, this, this guy needs to get saved. I'm standing next to this guy. This guy needs to get saved right here. Let me get the pastor on the phone. Where's my cell phone? I got to get the pastor over here because he needs to pray with that guy, get him saved. And Oh, my cell phone battery is dead. Oh, my goodness, my battery is dead. We can't get you into heaven. I got a dead battery. When you're the one that's supposed to be praying with them, the pastor prayed with you. You prayed with them. Yeah. Hallelujah. He gave some apostle, prophets, bands, pastors, teachers for the edifying of the saints for the work. The pastor's not for the work of the ministry. Y'all are for the work of the ministry. We teach you. You do the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. He said, I don't know. I think there's a comma in there somewhere, pastor. No, you read it again. Read it again. Hallelujah. And finally, I train my brain for success and I will pass every test set before me. God sets us up for success. He gives us all the answers to the, to, on the question, all the test answers before we ever take the test. The enemy came to Jesus. And Jesus said, I know, that, I know how to answer these questions. It is written, it is written, it is written. And that's what we do. As well, it's written. I know. I know this one. By His stripes, I am healed. I know this one. He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. My God shall abundantly do above, uh, uh, abundantly above all that I could ask or think. My God shall supply all my needs according to His glory, His riches in Christ Jesus. Greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. I, I know the Word. I can walk. I can walk on the Word. So I don't need to call anybody up. I don't need to search it out. I got it written on the tablets of my heart. I know how to pass this test. Glory to God. Uh, if, if I get a negative report, I know the positive report. <laughs> if I get someone coming against me, I know someone who's for me. Glory to God. If someone's aiming their aiming their weapon at me, no weapon formed against me will prosper. I know how this thing works. Glory to God. And so I'm going to pass every test that's put before me hallelujah because I have trained my brain for success if you believe it say amen if you believe it say amen Did you get anything out of this this morning hallelujah hallelujah come on stand up with me let's give the Lord a shout of praise hallelujah